Our church, Highway Tabernacle, is about following Jesus and loving people and sharing hope. And one of the values that we hold dear in going after this vision that God has given to us, one of the values we hold is that of healthy relationships. We can't really fulfill the will of God for us as a church if we don't even like each other. Or if we're just totally dysfunctional in how we relate to one another or even people in the world. So for the last several weeks, I've been preaching messages that focus on our relationship in this world and how we are to see ourselves as soldiers of Jesus Christ. Not fighting against people, but coming against things that are evil and that destroy people's lives. Now, we're in a series that's called Standing Strong in a Fallen World. What I want to do today is speak to you, again from Ephesians chapter 6, about the resources that are from above. Now, have you ever done a project at home? Like, say, you ladies, you, you just, you're saying, you know what, I want to put some pictures up on the wall. It doesn't seem like a very complicated project. But then you go look for the hammer and you can't find it, right? And so it becomes frustrating because you want to do something, but you don't have the equipment to do it. That used to be uh, me with oil changes in the car. I remember for many years I thought, I'm going to save money and I'm going to do oil changes. And every once in a while something would break and I wouldn't have the tool to fix it. So I'm in the middle of this driveway, and sometimes I spill the oil, and I don't have even a ride to get to the you know, gas station to, or, or the store to pick up another tool. Well, I have made the determination with the help of God, I'm never going to do an oil change again. <laughs> it's just so frustrating to me, I'd rather have somebody else do it. Well, do you think that God would give us assignments in life and not give us the equipment do you think he would do that? No. no. Our God is a God who supplies for us. He gives us what we need to do the job. Whether it's equipment, whether it's giftings, whether it's talents, whether it's spiritual weapons. Do you ever have battles right here in your mind during the week? Do you ever have battles with thoughts, or battles with discouragement, or battles with anger, battles with lust. There are all kinds of uh, things in this world that will come against us as believers. But God gives us the equipment to be able to overcome everything that comes our way. Amen. Yes. Now, we're going to read the spiritual armor section again. And we're going to get into other pieces of equipment that we have not looked at yet. All right. So, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 6, beginning with verse number 13. How about if you read it together with me? Would you guys do that? Yes, Lord. All right. Let's go ahead. You ready? Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Can you say amen at the reading of God's word? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Now. Say it with me. The end is to win. Say it again. The end is to win. 
On Monday night, when you're struggling with something, I want you to remember, be in it to win it. On Wednesday morning, when you're at work, and someone's really bothering you, and you're, you're, you're just really frustrated, I want you to say, be in it to win it. On Friday morning, when the devil attacks you and you're really discouraged because you've had a long week, I want you to say, Be in it to win. Okay, I think you got that. <laughs> and so, I ask you the question, has God called us to fail? No. Absolutely not. He doesn't call us to be failures. The scripture tells us that we are more than overcomers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so the question becomes, Lord, if you call me to overcome and not to fail, how am I to use the resources that you give to me? First, what are these resources, and how do I use them? In the last message that I preached to you, I felt God was uh, giving me the message from Ephesians 6 about the belt of truth. You, how many of you remember that message? We talked about the belt of truth. What was after the belt of truth that we put on? The breastplate of... And then we moved to the shoes of the... Gospel, right. The preparation of sharing the gospel of God's peace. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the final pieces of equipment that God gives to his people. And we're going to say, I'm in it to win it. All right. So the Lord tells us in his word that he gives us the shield of faith. And so what we are to do with this shield of faith is we are to receive it graciously from his hand. Let's read it again from the word, verse 16. In addition to this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now understand that in that day, the greatest uh, army in the world was that of Rome. Someone had said in their writings that the Mediterranean Sea had become a Roman lake. And that was pretty accurate because the Roman legions and the Roman soldiers, wherever they went, they would conquer. And it was in part because of how well trained they were. These were soldiers who had the highest technology available to them. And this equipment involved the shield. Now the Romans had two types of shields. They had small round shields which they would use in uh, combat one to one. But when they were together marching and in large battles, they would have these shields, and I'll, the name of them would be scutum shields, which would be some four feet high and two and a half feet wide. They were fairly heavy, but they were heavy for a purpose. They had covers, they were covered in leather as well, as wood and metal. And so when you would go against an enemy, then you would have, obviously, things coming at you. What would be some of the weapons coming at you? Arrows. Yeah. The arrows, there would be spears, javelins, uh, knives, and swords, right? All these sharp instruments, sometimes if the enemy soldiers didn't have that, they'd throw rocks at you. But if you had a large shield, that would protect and deflect the onslaught of the enemy. So the shield was vital for the defense in the battle. And so the shield is called, by the Apostle Paul, is called the shield of what? Faith. Now the shield of faith is not just faith about what we believe. And that's important. That is called the faith. You know, we all know, we all need to know what is the faith. But I believe that Paul, when he's talking about warfare and armor, this shield of faith can be understood as faith in action. This is 
what we do from day to day, how we live our life in this world. We need to have faith in action. Amen. It was James who said, well, you think you have faith? I'll show you my faith by what I do. So faith is not just a, like, a term, like a cloud out there, like, yeah, I have believe in faith. There it is, way up there. No, faith is the life choices that we make on a day-by-day -day basis. This shield is called the shield of faith, and we are to raise the shield. Amen. Do you think that pastors ever have uh, struggles as well? No. Sure. Yes. No? <laughs> well, let me enlighten you. <laughs> let me enlighten you. In fact, I think pastors have more struggles. Here's the reason why. Because if you're in a battle, and many enemy uh, armies would do this, if you're in a battle, then oftentimes you were told, aim for the sergeants. Aim for the lieutenants. Aim for the generals. Because when you take out the leaders, then oftentimes there's greater confusion in the battle. Sometimes I think we as pastors are spiritually like have a bullseye that's drawn on us by the enemy. And I remember one time, a few years back, that I was driving... And I remember just everything going wrong. Now, I know you never have times like this, but I was going through that time like, Lord, I don't understand anything of what's happening. And all of a sudden, the thoughts start to come into my mind. Well, you know, why don't you just quit? There's other things you can do. I mean, you know people that hire and that you could probably work for them. I mean... Why put up with the aggravation of ministry when you can do something else? It would be so much easier. Hmm. And I remember driving, and it was as if I'm just fighting this battle behind the wheel. I still have my hands on the wheel, but I'm, I'm going like this, I'm going like that, I'm going like this. And it's like I'm in, I'm in a battle because I'm just feeling it. It's just hitting me over and over again. And I had to put up the shield of faith. Amen. I had to say, God, even though I don't really see anything right now, I don't understand anything right now, but I believe in you. Amen. My faith is in you. And I will choose by faith, even though I did not even sense the Holy Spirit, I didn't sense Him. I said, I will choose by your grace to believe what you say rather than what my circumstances Amen. say. Amen. So by the grace of God, I was able to win that battle. I came out a little bit bloody, but I came out. That's right. That's right. Okay? Yeah. One pastor friend used to say, we're going to make it. We may not look like much, but we're going to make it. Amen. Okay, you hanging in there? Yes, the shield of faith. And the shield of faith requires us also, let me just say this one thing before going on. The shield of faith also requires us to be together. Amen. You know, one of the amazing things about the Roman shield was it was made in such a way that it could lock together with other shields beside it. There are little pieces that could kind of interlock so that when the enemy would shoot those arrows, sometimes dipped put into fire, that those flaming arrows would come, and because they had long shields, it would just be a wall that would be impenetrable. And the Romans had this formation that was called the turtle. And when the arrows would come from raining down from on from above, some of the so uh, soldiers in that formation would have their shields up, and the other ones would have their shields out, so it looked like a complete armored cover, the turtle. So they won so many battles because they were together rather than separately. There's a lesson there for us. Now, be in it to win. Say it again. Be in it to win. What's God give us next? What does He say that He's provided for us? The helmet of salvation. 
Read it with me. Take the helmet of salvation. Now you know, don't you, that God's equipment for us, the spiritual armor, is not something like clothing. It's not something that we take off in the evening and put on in the morning. No, it's something that we stay, you know, we have stayed on us. And so the helmet is not just, you know, like, well, I'm saved on Tuesday, but oops, I sinned and I'm on Friday, so I'm not saved anymore. No, 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 no. We repent and we make things right, but we still keep the helmet on. Amen. Right? Amen. So the Bible tells us, take the helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet of salvation is a, a mighty gift that God gives to us. And I remind you that our salvation is not because we achieve something. Mm -hmm. okay, you understand that, right? Amen. I might have told you this before, but it bears repeating. When I was 16 years old, I was going to church, but I didn't know Jesus. And it's sort of like I was lost in the house. You know, like the parable of the lost coin? The coin was lost, but it was in the house. I was lost in the house. And I remember at 16 years of age, I had the privilege of getting my license. Yes. And I don't know what was wrong with the pastor's head at that time, but he allowed me to drive the church van to go pick people up. As a 16 year old. Maybe they had more relaxed ideas than, than me. You know? But anyway, so here I am as a 16 year old driving around picking up people for church even though I don't even know Jesus. But, you know, I'm happy to do it. It's like, I like to drive. I think I like to drive the van. Sure, I'll do that. I gave my life. I stopped running from God when I was 17 years old. And the thought came into my mind was, you know, Jesus saved you because you were such a nice young man. You're know, driving the van, picking, picking up people. You know, he saved you because you were doing these nice things. You know where that came from, that thought? It didn't come from God, that's for sure. God doesn't save us because we're just nice little people that are just so good. And, you know, just, God just wants to scoop us up and love us. We're saved because of grace. We're saved because God, the Bible says, while we were still sinning, Jesus died for us. So don't ever think that, you know, like, whoa, I was just so it, and so special. God's grace is because He loves us, even as sinners. So the helmet of salvation is an amazing gift. And here's the thing. No matter how low you get and how on the battlefield you might be wounded and you might feel like your knee's been taken out and you're lying in a trench and you're bleeding, no matter how low you get and how difficult it is, you can always remind yourself that I am saved. I am on my way to heaven. That Jesus Christ has saved me no matter what I'm going through, what can... Nothing can take away from the salvation of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 8, shall persecution, shall famine, shall sword, shall nakedness, nothing can separate me from the love of God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Amen. So he gives us the helmet of salvation. Don't ever think, oh, well, I know that. This is so elementary. Every day, thank God for your salvation. Amen. If you're saved, thank God. Alright. And the next piece of equipment, which is so interesting. I want you to get this, okay? Receive the sword of the Spirit. Okay? Now, believe it or not, I'm almost done. So, listen quick. Here's what the Bible says. Verse 17, read it with me. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the sword of the Spirit. Now, interestingly, when the Apostle Paul, as he's writing Ephesians, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, as he writes all the different pieces 
of the spiritual equipment and armor that we have, he mentions only one weapon that is the a weapon of offense. And that is this weapon right here, the sword. So the Roman soldiers would carry a shorter sword with them, which is more like a long dagger, so that in close quarters there could be defense and there could be offense happening at the same time with a shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. So what is this saying to us? Are we to um, take the Bible and cut people to shreds? <laughs> no, no, that's not what the Bible is saying. Because our warfare, again, is not with people, right? It's with ideas, it's with thoughts, it's with uh, spiritual entities that are called principalities and powers. Yes, even demonic forces and Satan himself. That God has called us not to just always be on the defensive. Sometimes the one who attacks needs to feel the sword in the attacker. Amen. Okay? So the Lord has called us then and given us a mighty weapon. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I would like to encourage you. Practice using the sword. Practice using the sword. Victory on the battlefield is going to be determined by victory on the practice field. What would you think of a, a baseball player? The only time that they play would be the game that you see on TV. They wouldn't be very good, would they? But what you don't see about baseball players is all the time they practice their timing with the pitching coming in. All the times the thousands of ground balls that they will field. We don't see that. We just see the results of that in the sport. And so the Lord would have us know that if we're going to win in those times of spiritual battle, those times when they're very intense, it does us good to practice the Word of God, to just read and study and meditate on the Word of God so that when the days of evil come, we have that sword, it's sharpened, it's ready to go. i never forget a man that I, I used to pastor in the church and he was one of those guys that was so frustrating to work with. Why? Because he would complain so much. And he would be down in the mouth so much. I would say things like, like to him when he was going through a trial. I would say, have you got before God and asked him for, to speak to you from his word? He said, no, oh, no, I, I just, I tried that already. It doesn't work. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, what about just trusting God? I, he said, well, I, I tried that too. You, you know, God doesn't work. You don't try Jesus. Amen. You trust Jesus. Amen. Okay, there's a big difference. Okay, don't just, oh, try it, it didn't work. You don't try, you trust. God comes through, but he might not come through when you snap your fingers. He wants you to trust him. And the reason why he was so frustrating is because he was filled with his own thoughts. He wasn't filled with God's thoughts because he didn't get into the word. So whatever would come to his brain, he would think, well, that's, that's got to be true because I thought it. No. God wants to change our thinking to become like his thinking. <clears throat> because our thinking is often stinking thinking. God wants to change that. He wants us to become more like Jesus. What did Jesus do when he was attacked by the enemy? Patient. Then he said, Oh God, I think this is it. I think I have to die. 
if you read that in the Bible, you're in the wrong Bible. <laughs> Jesus, when he was attacked, it is written. Read it, Matthew chapter 4. Satan attacks him again. What does Jesus say? It is written. It is written. One thing I know about Jesus and the devil. Jesus never had long conversations with the devil. <laughs> So if you're going out all day long talking to the devil, then you have to rethink your whole plan. Okay? Thank you, Lord. Probably the longest thing that Jesus said to the devil was, Get behind me, Satan. Those are good words to say. Okay? I know more people that talk about the I know some people that talk more about the devil than they do about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. So use the sword of the spirit. Practice the Word of God. Yes. Get God's thinking into your mind. Thank you, Lord. Because what will happen is this. You'll find yourself, you know, whistling along in life. Everything's going good. Then all of a sudden the bottom drops out. And you're in the middle of the, the biggest trial that you've had. And you're saying, God, I don't know what to do. And the Word of God somehow surfaces in your mind. A promise comes to you that you can hold on to. Oftentimes because you put it there earlier in your life. God will take things that you put there and resurface them in your heart. Amen. It's good to practice the Word of God. Yes, Lord. Now I was a student for many years of my life. And I found that there was a real stupid prayer to pray. <laughs> you want to hear the stupid prayer of a student? <laughs> Here it is. God, help me to remember those things that I did not study. <laughs> hey, how many of you know that's the spirit of spirit? That's not the spirit of God. Because if we don't even open and crack the Bible, or even know what the Bible says, then how are we ever going to use the Bible as a sword when the time of trial comes? So we got to at least put it in. Uh, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys, you know, you love the Word of God. <laughs> You're showing up to hear the Word of God. Amen. There are other people that, you know, my life is fine. I'm a Christian. I don't need to go to church. And then they fall off the cliff and they're broken at the bottom. So the Word of God go wrong. Hello? Hear the Word of God. Love the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Get together where the Word of God is preached. Fight with the sword. They were the most feared army in the world. Conquered everywhere they went. We, of course, don't agree to their brutality and their tactics. But God used something that people could see with their eyes. And he said to his believers, open up your eyes because I want to show you something in the spirit. Thank you. Just as they overcame, I want you to overcome. Thank you. And I haven't left you alone. Thank you, Jesus. You're not in this world fighting off all these temptations on your own self-will and self-power. God forbid. Yeah. Yeah. I, God would say, I have given you everything you need for life and godliness. The Lord God has given us the equipment. All we have to do is to be willing to keep it on. Keep it on. How many of you remember Winston Churchill, that name? I end with this. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of England in the days of World War II. And as they saw you know, Hitler's Planes coming over England, dropping the bombs. Winston Churchill made a speech. And he made the speech actually to his alma mater, where he graduated from. And he, he said this in his speech, words that will never uh, be forgotten. His, the message that he gave to the people of England and to this school was this. And I quote. He said, never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in. 
except to your convictions of honor and good sense. Amen. Don't you love that word? Yes. Never give up. Never give in. If God is for us, who can be against us? God specializes in taking the things that seem to be dead, seem to be impossible, seem to be defeated, and snatching them out of the jaws of death. Thank you, Lord. When Jesus was on the cross, it looked like he had failed. Right? It looked like it was over. Even the people at the cross watching him die <coughs> mocked him and spit at him and said, hey, if you are who you say you are, come down now we'll believe in you. What looked like failure became the greatest victory the world had ever seen. Amen. Because Jesus never quit. Amen. Jesus never gave in. And the same spirit of Jesus is the same spirit that resides in the people who trust Him. Amen. So brothers and sisters, our church here at Highway Tabernacle, or anyone else listening, we can experience victory in this life and then go to heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.